too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are really delighted with the turnout and sincerely appreciate the time of our, our panelists here uh, this morning to talk about an issue that's obviously uh, of interest to all of us in terms of short-term rentals. Um, appreciate the, uh, the interest that started out as something that, that was of interest to our town council and the housing task force that the town of Frisco has had working since May. I, I made a casual announcement a few weeks ago at a housing board meeting and ears perked up and interest um, uh, started, uh, started to grow. And so we realized that this was, this was too good to keep to ourselves. And so we thank you. Uh, uh, we have Greg here from Vail, uh, several representatives from all the towns and the county in Summit County. And uh, like I said, we appreciate your being here too. This is an opportunity for, I think, for all of us to learn uh, from folks who have uh, been there, done that. In some cases, just now uh, passed ordinances that have yet to go into effect. So there are a lot of different uh, levels uh, or in terms of uh, time of experience with short-term rentals. It would be very interesting to compare notes. Um, I will introduce the panel. And, and as they get to, uh, to start talking, uh, they'll, I'm sure, share a little bit more about themselves and their, their communities. Um, we will have a set of common questions for, for all of them. We'll ask them to take a couple, three minutes and, and address what's happening in their communities, how they approach certain problems and that sort of thing. And then we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next question. We would like you to, as you get questions, I'm sure you will, jot them down, make a note to yourself, we'll come back to audience questions at the, at the end to kind of keep this flowing well. We do have a, a sixth panelist who is uh, not with us, but will be joining us by phone, Scott Shine, who's the planning director in Durango. Um, I was not able to, to join us in person, but toward the end, we'll get him on the phone, ask him the, uh, the six, five or six questions that we've asked the rest of the panelists, and he'll have a chance to go through that all at once, so we're not keeping him hanging on the phone for two hours here. And he'll always, uh, that would be able to uh, respond to your questions as well toward the end as, uh, as we get going. Um, with that, we introduce the panel. We really appreciate their, their time and effort to be here, and look forward to hearing from them. Um, to my immediate left, is uh, Town of Crested Butte Community Development Director, Michael Yerman. Um, it's going to be very interesting to hear from Crested Butte because as you'll find out, they just adopted an ordinance in August that is yet to go into effect, and so some of the wounds may still be fresh as uh, Michael <laughs> starts talking to us. Um, Estes Park, Town Administrator Frank Lanc Lancaster has joined us. Uh, Frank has a somewhat unique experience in that he was for 34 years or so with uh, Larimer County. So he has experience in oversight, understanding of countywide issues, as well as the last six years as town administrators in Estes Park. Um, to Frank's left is Mintern, uh, well, I'm missing one, excuse me, um, Georgetown Town Clerk Jennifer Yopsky. Um, she's been the town clerk for the past three years, I understand. Georgetown has adopted a short-term uh, rental ordinance a year ago that's limiting short-term rentals to about 7% of their housing stock. To Jennifer's left is Town Clerk and Treasurer Jay uh, Brunvan. Jay also has a unique experience of being a Summit County native, still a Summit County resident, having been a Silverthorne Town Council member, um, lives in, in Silverthorne, understands Summit County, as well as uh, for the last several years being over in <coughs> Minturn, so he understands Eagle County and Minturn's issues as well. So we look forward to hearing from you, Jay. And at the very end there, from Salida, Court Clerk Monica Weiner. Um, Salida has passed a moratorium on short-term rentals, followed by some new 2017 regulations with a very limited number of new licenses based on some very specific and tight criteria. So, we appreciate the panel. While I'm at it, um, so I don't forget whenever Scott Shine joins us by phone, Scott's the planning director in uh, Durango. He's been there the last 18 months as planning director, um, four years within the community development part department, and as we'll hear from Durango, they've probably been at this longer than any of us. Uh, they passed some what they called vacation home ordinances back in 1989. They tweaked those in 2008 and 2009. And as Scott will be able to tell us, they have perhaps the most restrictive ordinance that I've seen, limiting short-term rentals to one per block phase in town. So it'll be interesting to hear from him kind of at the, at the end of the program. And again, about 1 o'clock, 105, we'll, we'll switch. It'll be your show, your, your opportunity to uh, to ask our panel any questions you have. So, with that, um, let's get underway. First question I think we have for all of you is to kind of paint the picture in your town. Describe for us the circumstances and the, uh, and the situation that, that led you to consider 
limitations and regulations on short-term rentals. Well, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, our discussion started about two years ago. Uh, we had quite a few uh, residents show up during public comment um, voicing concerns regarding um, the the advent of this new market, which is the short-term rental, and the loss of long-term rental housing um, for rental. And the council at the time directed the staff to put together a committee um, based on representatives from the community, as well as representatives from the uh, vacation rental market, property managers, so and so forth. Um, and we worked for a year on developing regulations. Um, one of the interesting things, though, that the panel discovered was that regulating short-term rentals was not going to be um, very proactive, or it's not, wasn't going to change the economic dynamics that were going on in town with the price of housing. Uh, and that really to go forward with addressing affordable housing, some other solution would need to be um, brought forward. And one of the things that we're doing is this November there's a 5% uh, use tax on short-term rentals that will go directly towards, towards affordable housing. As anticipated, only bringing them though about 2,500 to 300,000 a year, um, which is basically one unit a year at the end. But obviously we will try to leverage that money. Um, but then as we started getting into the discussions, there certainly was a lot of um, discussion regarding neighborhood impacts. Um, and then also just that, you know, this really is a commercial use and that there was a lot of neighbors that started showing up to the meeting saying, hey, you know, I bought in a residential neighborhood. I didn't expect to have, you know, a new neighbor every day or every, every weekend, um, people in hot tubs till two in the morning, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was really mixed. Um, and also there's a big component of our community. I mean, we're a town of 1,500. There's a big component of the economics of property management employees that they employ. Um, it's a big economic driver in town. We do not have any major hotels in town. We have small boutique hotels, um, 30 units or more, or, or less, sorry. So, you know, this has become a big bed base for us as well as a tourist town. Um, and so when we started looking at all those things, it was very apparent after the first couple of meetings that there was going to be no golden bullet, no, no way to appease everybody. Um, and so we went on for almost two years. Um, can't even tell you how many meetings, probably over 30 meetings we held on this particular topic. Um, and we basically came out with a compromise uh, that put a cap on the number of, unit, um, number of units at 30% of the community. Um, we, I'll hold you there because that, that's going to be the second question. Okay. So, um, any other kind of comments on no. what led to that? Uh, no. Okay. Good. Frank? Well, I can say ditto for a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, we had a lot of uh, conversions. It seemed like in the last few years the, 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 um, the VRBOs and the vacation rentals kind of took off. Um, we started hearing a lot of complaints from people about changing the residential character of the neighborhoods. Um, folks in the workforce that were losing their housing, people were actually having their leases not renewed and people were converting them to vacation rentals. One of the big changes I saw over the last few years that we never saw before We've always had a lot of vacation rentals in the, in the Estes Park area. But a lot of them were people who had a vacation home as their second home, and they would rent it out to help pay for it, but it was their home. Or we have a lot of people who want to retire there from the Midwest, and they come and buy a home. They help pay it off by a vacation rental uh, during the season, and then eventually they want to live there full time. Um, that was the majority of them. Uh, we figure about 42% of our homes are second homes in town, uh, but what we started seeing is people starting to buy them as parts of real estate portfolios, and they had no intention of ever living in them or going there, and they were buying up multiple houses, converting them to vacation rentals, and just using them as an investment. They have, I mean, they're good people, but they have a different attitude towards home ownership than somebody who's, it's their home, they own the stuff inside, they treat it as a business. Some of them aren't really interested in the future of the town or what's going on. They're just looking for return on their property. And those are ones we started to see some problems with. Um, so noise was a big one. Uh, character of the neighborhood was a huge discussion. Uh, level playing field with the rest of the accommodations. The people have bed and breakfast that are licensed to people who have hotels that they felt this was, they weren't being treated the same way. 
uh, even under the building codes, they're treated differently under the residential code versus the commercial code. So it's cheaper to build. We saw people start building large single family homes uh, with 10 bedrooms or something like that, that really were mini hotels, but they build them under the residential code so they could save a lot of money. And then they were competing unfairly with the, with the accommodations. Uh, one thing I need to say about Estes Park that's a little unique, and we did this when I was at Larimer County back in 2000, is with some legislative changes, is we have a single land use code for the town and the surrounding county area. We got the Larimer County planning area, or the Estes Park planning area, and it surrounds our valley. We're kind of surrounded by the National Park, National Forest, and we're almost like a, an island. And I'm sure anybody's been on either side of the street, uh, you have the conflicts between county's land use code and development code and the towns and the annex and things don't fit. Well, we decided to get around that by having a single one. So we have a single planning commission that's appointed by the county commissioners and the town board, single board of adjustments, single board of appeals. We have a single um, land use code and master plan and it's all the same. So when I talk about it, I'm talking about the whole Estes Park Valley. We have to treat them a little bit differently because counties and Towns have some different authority, but we're talking about the whole area. Uh, all our land use goes through the single land use plan uh, or land uh, planning commission, and then it goes to the appropriate either town board or board of county commissioners for final approval. So when I talk about what it is, I'm talking about not just the uh, corporate limits of Estes Park, but the, the Estes Valley. And it's population-wise, we're about um, about 14,000 people. Okay, so I'm from Georgetown, and um, we had about probably only like four or five in 2014, and then um, notice in 2015 that we were um, just by going on the sites that there was about 40 or so in town. So we start that is what made us um, go after trying to um, decide if we were going to limit them or not, and kind of just a lot of the same things that these towns went through. Um, wanting to keep, um, we didn't want to lose a lot of our stock for locals and found that that was happening and um, we put a 7% um, limit on it for each ward and we're a town of about a thousand. Okay. Um, we're a town of about a thousand also in Minturn and it is, it was one of those that we passed a lodging tax a number of years ago and We've got one um, low-income hotel, I guess you would call it. Um, the conversation started out with, I think we got rid of the beds with the bed bugs in them, um, which is never a good thing to hear in a hotel. Um, and then we've got a couple or three um, bed and breakfasts, um, and we all of a sudden I was, um, I would go home and get a beer and sit in front of my computer and find these these uh, bed and bre these rentals and they were just popping up all over the place we were having a lot of trouble with citizens saying that they're they're using my trash can they're using my parking there's no parking um Minturn, a, an alley can actually grow up to be a street um and i've also noticed that in Minturn, a, a house can grow bedrooms without knowing it um so you'll see on the website that if you go to the assessor's website, they've got three bedrooms. You'll see their VRBO website, and it's got um, sleeps 20. Um, and it's a 900-square-foot place. It's, so there's a huge impact on it. And I'd like to say ditto on the comment about the hotels. I think that there's a, there's a, there's a definite disparage between the, what the hotels and the commercials have to go through and what the residentials have to go through. And unlike a hotel, if I'm doing a short-term rental, I can short-term it, I can long-term it, or I can use it as a second home or leave it empty. In a, in a commercial unit, you can't do that. Um, in a residential unit, the assessor taxes it as residential no matter how it's being used. In a commercial, it's commercial. And I've actually fought with the assessor, and she said it's a, um, it's a state issue. It's a state law that says how it's taxed. It's just not fair. So there's a lot of laws that have not caught up with what we're trying to do. 
Um, Minturn also is about a thousand people. We have a staff of nine, and four of those are public works employees. So to have to go out and police and monitor and catch, I mean, it's like catching butterflies. They're just all over the place, and you don't notice it until you either get called, you get somebody turning in their neighbor, you find it because you sat up and couldn't sleep one night, so you got on the computer. I mean, they're just all over. Um, and when we were trying to resolve this because we the short term the long term rental is losing units to short term rental um, when somebody can make you know conservatively twenty to thirty thousand dollars renting their place long term and they can make over one hundred and fifty thousand long term there's this you know I can tell you where I would go um, but I guess we'll get into the rest of the questions in a minute. Um, I'm from Salida, and 2016 is when they started looking at the controlling the short-term rental. And mainly the city population is full-time residents, um, and they were learning that when a unit was being sold that an investment was better um, to go to short-term instead of long-term renting. So it's become a housing issue for local employees um, who can't find long-term rental but they definitely when they were looking at the programs they studied the impact on living in the community in the residential neighborhoods and what kind of um, quality they wanted to keep the small town they didn't want third home owner investors that kind of thing. Um, we do have a lot, like everyone else, that's looking for um, buying a home and short-term renting, and that's going to be the <coughs> retirement home. And so they just want to pay off some of the mortgage before they could move to the community. Um, and then we did also check the impact on the quantity of affordable housing, which is a main issue that we're working on in the community and the public safety. Um, so those are some of the requirements for people that get licenses. We limit it to a segment which, which is just a city block. There's only one per block and we only do 3.5 percent of the total um, housing population for the community. So right now that currently means that yeah. For residential, we only have 72. Second question, so I'll, I'll oh, okay. Right there. Thank you very much. For You're being. welcome. Um, there are a lot of common themes that I heard from, from yeah. all of you. But nuisances, um, noise, trash, um, 2 a.m. hot tub parties, those kinds of things. also heard from some of you um, impacts on your lodging community, unfair mm -hmm. competition. But to what extent was workforce housing, impact on workforce housing, conversion of long-term rentals to short-term rentals identified as a, as a problem in your community? Um, the town has done a, basically a community census, um, and so beyond the actual census. So we've, we've tracked second home ownership, um, primary home ownership, rentals, and what was amazing is when you look from 2000 to today, um, basically our long-term rentals I don't have the numbers in front of me, but shrunk from about 46% of the housing stock to below almost 15%, whereas we saw a rise in short-term rentals from 5% almost to, well, it's, we're at, we've capped it at 30, but it is over 30 right now, it's about 32%. Um, and then the town actually has a uh, pretty robust uh, deep-restricted housing that we've been doing since the 90s. To give an idea, we have 21% of our housing has some type of deep restriction for local housing. Um, and so I think this the, that speaks for itself, the loss of long-term rentals, and I think this, this market has created, a, a, our market for the housing is just way overpriced for any kind of local that has a job in town that doesn't have a secondary means of income to purchase a house. So um, I definitely think that there's a realization that, you know, a $1.2 million home that someone could come in and buy, what they're, if they have the option, if, if they're told they can't short-term rent it, the odds of them saying, oh yeah, I'm going to put a long-term renter in there and not use it, you know, that's not really reality. Um, but there is definitely a trend 
because of this economy that this has created um, for allowing people to come in and invest in homes and create and you know pay their mortgages off um, by renting for three or four months of the year. Yeah, hard, kind of the same thing, but it's hard to put your finger on. I think there's a gut feeling it makes a difference, but we hear from some of the vacation rentals the same thing. The upper end vacation rentals probably never would have been workforce housing in the first place. Uh, if you've got a um, you know, 6,000 square foot house on 30 acres and it rents for $5,000 a month, that's not going to be what the, uh, the server in one of the restaurants is going to rent. So it, it's not a market. They're not competing with the same market. We do have some that are more affordable, and I do there anecdotally of people who have been asked to move out of their homes so they can go to a rental. But I'm, I'm not sure how big of a problem it is. It's very hard to quantify. I think it does have an impact, but it's not one for one. A lot of the ones that are vacation rentals, um, they keep them as a second home anyway, and they never would really be on the workforce market in the first place. Yeah, kind of the same thing. We thought in the beginning that the short-term rentals were <coughs> taken away from the long-term rentals. And and then when we had our public hearings, a lot of the owners were saying, well, we wouldn't rent it out as a long-term rental anyway because it would just go through more damage and, you know, it's it's better well-kept as a short-term rental. So. Um, the intern is about a 1,000 people and about rough, I mean, it, it's, it's longer than this, but it's about eight or nine blocks. It's not a massive length. We don't have real, real high-end housing. Um, Minturn's budget, at general fund, is about $1.5 million, and we're bookend by Vale and Avon, which have $50 million budgets. Um, we are the bedroom community for them, just as much as Leadville is. Um, we don't, we lost a lot of people that, a lot of workforce housing because of this. Um, and when when you're sitting there listening to the, the, the discussion between the council and the staff and the citizens, you start hearing things like, I wouldn't normally rent this out to a workforce housing. At the kind of money they're charging, you're there's they would be foolish too. Um, but the the concept is this is not something that that they should they, they should be buying their house for their for a home, not for something um, to turn into a hotel. Um, it it's a huge depletion on the resources. It's a huge depletion on the neighborhood itself, where people are using their the the guy's trash can. Um, enforcement of a party if if the cops go out or get a call and then they try to show up the next day, that person could have already moved on. Um, we do have a requirement that says that they have to have a manager within 50 road miles of, of the unit. And that way we kind of get back into this where we've got a, a face or a person that can actually show up on site um, if, if that's what's needed. And it's, I mean, to say that this is, you know, I, I did, the, I want to be able to own a house so I can ski up here and things, it's, that's a farce. Um, you know, this is, this is a huge, serious cash money that's coming in. Um, you know, when I think about it with my mortgage at, at my house in Silverthorne, um, you know, I'm roughly at about $12,000, $11,000 a year for my mortgage and taxes, and I can rent that for five to ten times that. I mean, that's just, we're stupid if that's what we're believing, is that they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, I was kind of serious. W one of the way the the problem that we have is is finding them as well. Um, I was talking to Jennifer, and one of the things that they do is you can you can hire a company that for five or ten thousand dollars will go out and find them for you. Um, I was paying my son ten dollars to find ones that I couldn't. I mean, it's you, you just get online and start looking. But that takes a, a warm body to do. You've got to have somebody physically there doing it. Um, we started this out because I was the <laughs> treasurer side of it. I'm trying to find tax, you know, the tax money to try to get some benefit out of this, these phone calls that we're getting. Um, we have about 75% of, of our property in town is, is residential. 
and about 25 is commercial and you know some of that has um, hotels a small hotel little bed and breakfast and stuff to to put that in perspective of what Vale's got they've got about 500 full-time residents and their bed base is 85,000 I mean it's it's there's no way to compete um, and to, to have to to take the the job of finding these things we started out with me doing it then we went we pushed it to a code enforcement which we contracted out for code enforcement um, this year starting in 2018 we'll bring code enforcement back in town inside it used to be part of the planning department she didn't want to do it so we contracted for it now it's coming back in we're hiring an employee to do code enforcement and part of the code enforcement is to find and, and administer these um, I hire an employee <clears throat> at $45,000 and with benefits that's a $75,000 investment to find somebody that's re that is paying $1,000 a year in taxes tops. Okay. Comments? Com uh, comments on uh, workforce housing and slide? Yeah, we have all the same issues, I think. But mm -hmm. I think one thing I've noticed is people are looking for the investment now because they're calling and saying, I'm interested in this property. Is it available for a license? Um, but they're calling 10 different properties. They're not going to buy unless they know that they can short-term rent it. So I think that's becoming a big issue. Okay, thank you. Let's switch gears. A lot of you have wanted to go there already, so <laughs> this is the chance. Um, and for all of you out there, if you didn't pick up the packet that out on the table, all, um, all six, I think there's seven ordinances. Manager Springs is also in here. Um, so we'd like to switch gears and start talking a little bit about the approach to regulation and limitation. I have a two-part question. What was your approach? What, what did you do to, to limit and regulate? And, and why? And some of you may want to start with the why and get into what, or vice versa. I'll leave that up to you. So Frank, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Well, the why is we should have done it 10 years before. Um, the horse was out of the barn, and, and it was really hard to go back with people that have already made commitments in some of these houses, and we just, uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't have allowed it. Actually, Larimer County does not allow short-term rentals. And uh, they made an exception in the Estes Valley in, in 2000, uh, somewhere in the early 2000s, and things went out, kind of got out of control at that point. Uh, we estimate in the valley we have just over 750 vacation rentals. So we're dealing with an awful lot of them. And the, the main thing we started looking at working with the vacation owners and the neighbors is how do we protect the character of the neighborhoods? Is it the same everywhere? Uh, we spent a whole year with multiple meetings and task force trying to come up with where we ended up. We looked at a lot of the other ordinances. Um, our topography doesn't yield very well. We're not on blocks, so it's hard to say one per block because some places they're on 30 acres, some places they're on a quarter acre. What we ended up with was limiting and putting a cap in the entire Estes Valley of 588 units um, in residential zones. We have no cap or we allow them in accommodations and commercial zones. In the residential zone, we limit it to um, eight occupants only. And so you can't have any, now if there, there are some nine or larger and they have to go through a special review process. They have to be in existence before the or before March of this year. They go through special review and they can be allowed. We'll, we won't allow any more nine or larger ones in residential from this point going forward. So we did limit it to smaller ones. Within those, we limited to um, two occupants per bedroom plus two. So somebody has um, two bedrooms, they can have six people. If they have three bedrooms, uh, they can have two more. So we limit it that way. Um, what's a bedroom? That has turned into a really huge thing for us. <laughs> they get really creative. Um, one of the things we've done now since we've acquired the licensing is we we require an inspection, initial inspection, and what they advertise has to match up with what's in the assessor records. And a bedroom is defined as what the building code requires as a, a bedroom, so it has to have proper egress, it can't have gas appliances, um, it has to have the right size windows, and there were an awful lot of them that had rooms um, that were, you know, when they lived there it was a broom closet, but once they put it out as a, 
uh, vacation rental, that was a bedroom. So we're going back to a lot of the places and saying you cannot have that many bedrooms and we're shutting them down. Um, we monitor their advertising. We do use a, a, a company. Um, we use a company called Host Compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, we split the cost with the county. But because we have so many, we can afford it. It's, it's not cheap. It's $50,000 a year um, for all the services we get. But they also then will monitor 24 hours, take phone calls, take complaints, and then they have the information to contact the property, the property manager. We do the same thing. Uh, they have to have a property manager 24-7 within the Estes Valley in case there's a problem. And then they have these... Um, internet bots to just go through and climb through all these sites and find them. And if we find somebody who's advertising and they don't, they haven't been licensed, then we send a code uh, compliance person out to get them. Um, we require that all advertising have their registration number on it. I think Durango did that, and I thought it was a great idea mm -hmm. because then it makes it really easy. They've got the number, we check, make sure it's valid, and then we can find them. But we've we found that actually after going through that for about six months, I think we've got most of them uh, under control and licensed or at least in the, in the queue by going through that process. Jim? We do kind of the same thing. We have a life um, safety inspection and that um, checks to make sure that they have fire extinguishers, smoke alarms, maximum occupancy, the egress, and... Um, Let's see what else we have. The seven percent in each board. Oh, we we start. We why we did it was we were having uh, the police were receiving lots of calls about parties, and um, <laughs> I think that's it's a lot of the same stuff that that you're saying. One thing I did mention I should have is our fees. Mm -hmm. um, we charge a business fee, business license fee of two hundred dollars as a base fee, and then fifty dollars a bedroom. We can't do that in the county because counties don't have the statutory authority to do business licensing. So they just offer a issue a land use permit and it doesn't cost anything in the county. Um, we do a lot of that, but we got we got meaner. Um, <laughs> you're, and you're right. A lot of times it's not necessarily the broom closet; it's the hallway that becomes a, a bedroom. We have an annual on-site inspection that checks for fire extinguishers, checks for smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, checks for beds that grew, things like that. And it's annual, and, and they have to do it every year. Um, we have a two-year ownership period before people can do the short-term rental. Um, we passed this rule June or July, this law, our ordinance. Um, so we said September 1st, boy, this is the hanging date. You're going to, you know, you got to come into compliance. We realized that there were so many problems with people that, you know, that was so far out that we actually moved it to October 1st, and I think we're still on October 1st. We did a pretty good job of hitting that. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like my kids when they were little. Every time I thought I had it under control, something else came up. So every time I think I've got them all in, under, under wrap, a little snake squiggles out between my fingers. Um, when you think about, and I said this before, that um, the house can rent for about $2,500 a month for long term in, in, in the Vale Valley and Minturn, a decent one. Um, a short term can rent just as an occupancy of about 50%, $2,500 a week. That's thirty to $60,000 difference between what they can make. And I know of a number of hours are renting for $1,000 a night. So we're at 50% occupancy, that's $180,000 a year. Um, again, this is not, you know, there, there's an incentive to do this. Um, and there's, you know, when you start thinking my little 1.5% lodging tax and 4% sales tax, that's, that's really not enough to bump them, but it's enough to make them, oh, I didn't think about coming to the town to ask. Um, we do require an annual license, and with that comes the inspection every year. Um, and I think that's the one that's going to hang them up, is we check <clears throat> the assessor's website, and it says it's got three bedrooms. If we go in and we find that their website is saying 
that they've got an occupancy of 20, we'll shut them down. Um, we have been, we do, we do have the 50 road mile for, for management companies, and part of it, if, if you know the Vail Valley or the Eagle Valley, it goes from from Eagle, Eagle, the town of Eagle to Minturn is roughly the same distance as the, as the drive from Silverthorne to Minturn. I, I know I do both of them <laughs> quite a bit. Um, it's about 38 miles, 35 miles to do that. So 50 miles isn't a terrible, a terrible distance. They are 24 hours. They have to be able to respond. Um, I still troll the websites looking for s the sales tax. A lot of times they'll sign up, they'll, they'll submit their lodging tax, and then I'll compare it with the state which collects our sales tax. Um, it's really kind of a, a neat secret when the state collects your sales tax because you can turn them into the state. And, and I've always had the same, men turn so small, you really want to be careful who you um, call a fool because you might be taking their daughter out for dinner that night. Um, it's just too small to, to not have, you know, to, to lose friends. And by turning them into the state, mm -hmm. you you still have that ability to to not lock your car. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, we encourage with the large we have um, we have a development that is about four thousand acres that will have anywhere from from four or five units per acre to um, one per 35, roughly, and, and they're selling a ton of, you know, it could be sold a ton of it. We annexed this parcel in in about 2008 or 10, and they have not raised one stick for, you know, in, in building. It's just been sitting empty. Um, so there are people out there that can spend $30 million on land and do nothing with it. I want you to know that. Um, we With that, I've been kind of pushing our planning department and our you know, our, our next step to encourage mother-in-law apartments. Um, and the idea would be you get a, an 8,000 square foot house and we allow a, a mother-in-law apartment there that might require another water tap, but at 8,000 square feet in the Vail Valley, that's not saying much. Um, and that would allow them to have a long-term rental that they could, not a short-term, but a long-term rental that would even be somebody sitting there washing their house while they're at one of their other four houses. Um, and I'm hoping that that will come through. Um, we, you know, that's our next step that we're going to start looking at. Um, and then we we also limit the unit to, to 50 units townwide. We don't have per block, or we don't have wards, or um, or we do 10% of our housing stock. Right now we're at about 25 units, 28 units. So that's not something that we're worried about. When we did pass this ordinance, we lost about 5 out of 20. We lost about 25% of it. So when you think of it that way, we lost quite a few, but those have since backfilled and we've gotten them, we've gotten them back in spades. But it's one of those that when they started going, oh, I gotta be policed by this, I don't want to do it anymore, they stopped doing it. And then some of them actually caught cheating again. Um, we also are really pretty strict on a three-strike rule. If, if cops show up three times, if you miss your tax payments three times, if you aren't paying your water bill, various things like that, we'll pull your license. And we'll pull it for up to, I think it's up to, it's up to a couple of years. It could be up to two or three years. That they can't do it anymore. If they're caught, we'll cite them with a, with a ticket. And our ticket is up to $1,000 per citation and we can do that once a day so we could in a week they're you know they're at seven grand that it encourages them to play by the rule um we've had one that we've had to deal something with that on and it's so that you know but again it's like in a small town if if i call up the sales tax auditor it sort of gets through the community that he's in town and everybody kind of toes the line a little bit a little bit closer Well, I agree with Jay in that once you think that you have everything under control, it changes again. But um, Salida, we do limit the residential. Um, like I was saying, uh, we have a total of 110 county commercial, industrial, and residential. 
And the residential is the ones we cap. Uh, right now we only allow like 72 licenses. Um, we only allow one person to get one license. They can't have multiple homes and get multiple licenses. And um, we allow self-inspection for the monitoring systems in the home, parking, all that stuff, mainly because we don't have the, our police or our fire department doesn't have the manpower to go inspect the homes. So we do allow that. We don't allow apartments to short-term rent. And we have ADU requirements that were relaxed so that they are more open to employee housing for long-term. And then um, we only allow one per block in a segment, we call them, which is just a street, uh, so that it doesn't make an impact on the rest of the street for parking and everything like that. Um, and we don't grandfather in people that um, have been doing this ever since they had their homes there. Uh, we don't allow that. Um, and probably just, we're at the point now where we're learning how to control the situation and make sure everyone's abiding by the rules. For the license. Okay. Thank you. Like I said before, um, our process played out over almost two years. Um, so the um, but initially what was interesting was the finance department was just issuing business licenses, and they were you know, giving out to anybody who applied for a short-term rental. Um, and then we realized um, once it started becoming that the you know obviously the finance department wasn't doing anything wrong, they were just processing applications, but they were processing applications for short-term rentals in Zen districts that weren't permitted. Um, so when we figured that out, we put a stop to that and we moved the, the actual issuance of the license over in the planning <coughs> building um, so that we could do it at a, a, a very minimum at the beginning of this two-year process, start doing a zone compliance, zoning compliance. And we stopped issuing um, licenses to anybody that had a deed restriction on their property um, or where our commercial districts um, our commercial districts and some of our other districts require that any residential unit built is for long-term housing. So we really put a mix on that. Um, like I said, this all started with community um, comment at the beginning of the council meeting. And so our approach was to have a committee. Um, and we met for about six months in the committee. Um, and again, it was a, you know, a range of from property owners to concerned citizens um, to property managers. Um, and the committee came out with a series of recommendations and they brought it to the council. And one of them was for, to put a moratorium in place to adopt, um, adopt the codes. Well, the moratorium got out. Um, some of our council members actually applied for, for short-term rental license before the, before the moratorium. Um, and so that fell flat on its face, as you can imagine. Um, and so that kind of really started the public hearing process off on the wrong foot. So is this a suggestion if you're considering a moratorium, maybe like actually don't do an emergency moratorium, give it that proper public noticing, and then you know inform your elected officials before the moratorium goes in place. It should let everybody know. Um, so that was one of the big pitfalls that we did in our approach. But what was interesting is that we actually passed two ordinances. The first one there was a, there was all around consensus on we need to be inspecting for life safety. We need to be collecting sales tax. We need to try to minimize neighborhood impacts. Um, and then the second ordinance was getting into the zoning and the caps. Um, and so, you know, that second ordinance took probably another six months to get in place. Um, and we did a lot of <coughs> analytics on, you know, how many units we currently had and what was the correct percentage. You know, given our 21% deed restricted housing, we're trying to get up to 25%. You know, what was the mix, you know, to have 50% of the community tied up in either short-term rental or deep restricted housing? It seemed like, you know, let the fair market play out on the other 50%. It's kind of the rationale. Um, and where we landed, we also, the other thing that the council did um, in, out of the community recommendation was allow anybody who actually lives in town that has their unit as a primary residence, that's not, as long as it's not deed restricted, um, the ability to get a primary residence license 
which they can rent for up to 60 days, um, non-consecutive, but they always have that right. Um, and they're not in the cap. Um, and so our fees for an unlimited license, which is your typical VRBO, is $750 a year. Um, and you are required to have a license for two year for a two year period, so it's $1,500 starting January 1st. And then a primary residence license is only $200, um, and that's to incentivize some of the locals to give up. Again, when the moratorium was set, our numbers went from 176 to 240 in two weeks. Um, I think about 30 of them were actually illegal rentals that were paying sales tax, so it actually it was somewhat of a good thing. Um, but then a lot of locals just kind of went out and got a license prospecting that this would somehow raise their or affect their property values. Um, we're estimating that to have an inspector um, and to do all these fees and licensing to pay for the programs that monitor, we're, we're budgeting about $160,000 um, a year. And, that's, and again, the fees are just going directly to that. And then the last thing we're doing right now, again, in November is a 5% um, use tax on these. <laughs> To try to level the playing field with the logging industry. Okay, Michael, you did, you did a good job of kind of explaining how you arrived at your cap. I think all of, all of the others of you mentioned that you have caps, but I'm curious about your comments about how did how did you get there? What you know, uh, Jay, for instance, I think 50 in winter. What's the magic behind that number? Um, we have about 500 residential units, so 10 percent and 50 is kind of where they came out at. We also thought, and I was not agreeing, but they kind of came up with the idea that 50 was a lot um, and, and it would be an effect. Um, that's kind of where we came up with the cap. Um, we determined 3.5% um, of the total dwelling units in the city limits. So it can change every year as, Ooh. you know, as long as, it's growing. as long as it's growing, yeah. And one thing I didn't mention before is we did not allow license to be transferred. You know, people try to sell their homes and say, hey, we have a short term. We don't allow that. Um, they would have to just reapply. And we do charge $50 per year for a license and 200 one-time planning commission review. For ours, it was the planning commission looked at the estimate how many we have. Um, we used... Uh, on a short-term basis, again, um, post compliance to try to do an estimate how many we had, came up with somewhere around at 750 or so. Um, then they made an estimate of how many they thought were in residential districts versus uh, commercial. So it was about two thirds. They ended up with a number of 588, which is a, a weird number, but that's what the planning commission finally went back and forth on, uh, with the idea of trying to just limit it to what we had now, not taking anything away from anybody and just kind of put the brakes on at this point. That's how we ended up with 588. <coughs> we researched ours and we had, um, we had like 44 and so they decided that they wanted to keep it at, they didn't want to take it away from anybody. They wanted to sort of keep it at the same number with a little bit of room for growth. And so that's how they came up with a 7%. And then are any of you at that number? Have you hit your limit? In one no. ward we have. Well, what will happen when you do? Will there be a wait list? Uh, yeah. No we'll, wait list for us. We'll just deny, deny the license and they can re-check with us to see if somebody's fallen through on the renewals, which we go from like May 31st to June 1st. So it kind of rotates at an odd time. So if there's some available, they'd be able to apply at that time? Yeah. We are over our cap. Um, we have a wait list, and it's when you apply, you actually have to go online and apply, and the time dates, and it's just an order received. Um, I will say, you know, not that capping to a specific number is a bad idea, but I will say that doing the percentage, what's nice about it is, as you have the way at least ours works, is that as you add residential units, you can get additional permits. So it keeps keeps that, and that is. I think is one of the um, one of the better things about our ordinances was because we actually looked at a hard cap of 250, um, but when you put the percentage in, every time you get a new building permit, you know, every, I guess every three and new three and a half, you get an, an additional short-term rental, um, and so that gets people off the waiting list um, every year after you do your you know, building permit counts. 
um, you can issue maybe two or three additional licenses every year. And then we also don't allow our licenses to be transferred. So we kept them from being some kind of commodity that runs with the property. Okay. We're at 40 under our cap right now. Um, but the cap is, by ordinance, is reviewed by the Planning Commission yearly. Um, I actually like the percentage better. I think it works better, but that's what we have right now. Um, and I do like that we, we do a lot of transfers. And uh, unfortunately, we have some of the licenses are people who aren't renting, but they just went out and got a license. They're willing to pay for it because they think it increases the value of their house when they go to resell later on to say that it could be a vacation rental. So if some people have never rented and, and aren't rent doing it right now, but they want to reserve their right and tie up one of those licenses. Gotcha. This has come up a couple of times. We don't allow banking. You can't go and buy um, a short-term rental license and then not use it. Um, and if it's found to, you can't, you can't get one. And if we did hit our cap and you had lost your license or whatever, you couldn't, you, you wouldn't be able to get, you don't hold your space if you lost it because you couldn't behave. Um, so that was one of our incentives to, you know, try to do it. Um, a couple things just to note, this is really tough. And you said planning commission, which I kind of liked that idea. It's really tough for councils. Um, it's, you know, you, you get a meeting, it's packed like this. You've got people on all sides of it. Um, some of them yelling, some of them very, very emotional about what's going on, and the council's trying to appease everybody. Um, and, the, and so we did a lot of the work at staff um, than we did before we even took it to council. Um, it's, I've been on both sides of the, the, the board um, in various different hats I've worn, and it's, it's really not nice to put a council in a position where they're, they're in a corner. Um, we, we also found that by contacting the owner versus the occupant, um, we got better off. I sent a number of letters saying, I noticed you on the VRBO. Um, we do have a license and a, and a tax requirement. And they called me up, the owner would call me up and go, what are you talking about? That's a long-term rental. No, you're on VRBO. And they, <laughs> two people got kicked out, they lost their lease because they were short-term renting. Um, the the two year we do have I told you we have a two year um, um, that if you own your you can't you can't go right into the rental pool if you've got to own for two years in town you can do short or long term but you can't do short term um, that was grandfathered in we so because we did have some that didn't own for that long um, when with our inspections we've actually trained our code enforcer to be able to do. I mean, how hard is it to test a fire a fire horn, you know? Um, and with that, we also we also inspect their parking. It can't be four parking spots and the garage is full. It's two of them. Um, they have to be accessible by the renters. Um, we do have we had a place in Mentorn where the guy ended up tearing a wall out of his garage that he had put in because that was where he was keeping his owner stuff, which turned out to be a car um, that he would use when he was up here. So if they're going to rent it, they have to have the parking for those places and they have to have it available for use. Um, we do not allow transient, you, when, if somebody buys the, the, the short-term rental house, they, the license does not transfer with it. Um, and then they would fall into the two-year hang time anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, the renters doing the VRBO was a real, that was a shock to a lot of people. Um, and then I would go back through and audit them and make sure I got the money for the last few years that they were. Whenever they do come in, I do go through and make sure that, you know, if I caught them because they're on VRBO and they've got 15 um, recommendations on their, their site, tends to lead that they probably rented it a little bit and there's, there is some money out there. We already touched on it, but let, let's switch gears a little bit to, to talk about the public process and what you heard as you went through your adoption of your ordinances and what you're, you're kind of hearing since and some of your is it all different levels of, of this over the last few years. But what did you hear in terms of the, I'll call them the problems and the benefits, the cost and, the, and the, uh, the benefits of these programs? And to the extent that some of your programs have now got a track record, what are you, 
how are you comparing what you heard during adoption of an ordinance versus what you're actually kind of seeing as a track record? Um, Jennifer, we'll start with you on this one. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's all bad. In some ways, it's really, it is good for our town because we don't have hardly any hotels, and so, um, and with the ski traffic and everything, and we, you know, we're a tourist town. We need tourists, so I can't say that it's, it's all been bad. Um, I think having the local. Um, Contact helps a lot. People were worried about that. The neighbors, um, it's with parties going on and everything, and so that's that's been a help. And I, I guess the parking has been our biggest um, problem, especially in our historical area. And um, one of one license was denied because of that. But um, since we, and that's one thing that we do kind of need to. Well, I guess we'll talk about that later, but put more uh, to refine our approach on it um, is the parking. But um, I, um, I guess well, when I came over, I listened to NPR and in, in, in NPR, and it was kind of a negative show. So I'm I'm not as optimistic. I really don't <laughs> see an awful lot of benefits to the town. I see a lot of benefits to the renter. Um, the uh, there's about fifteen thousand dollars in various taxes that I would be able to collect um, on all of the properties combined, and it's I mean it costs seventy five thousand to put somebody to do it. There's just there's a there's a lot of headache. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of background work. There's a lot of um, people that get upset. The only one that actually is kind of happy that we did it that we attacked it are the neighbors. Um, they do like the idea that, that the trash can isn't being filled by, you know, the neighbors' beer cans. They do like that it's, it's, a, it's, it's just administered a little bit more consistently. Um, they like the idea that, that if somebody new comes in, they, just, they can't just turn it over and start doing short-term rental, that, you know, it's got to be part of the neighborhood for a while. Um, a second home is easier to finance. Another thing to think about when people are buying plot property is if you go into the, the lender and say that it's a second home, you could still be at about a 20% down payment right in that ballpark, 20 to 30. If you go in and you say it's an investment, you're probably looking at 50 to 60% down payment um, when you buy the place. So that alone encourages people to, to and, and like I said, I'm not as optimistic, it encourages them to go and lie. Um, there is a lot of money on the table when you're looking at a $500,000 house and having to pay for this thing. Um, and we just got out of a recession that a lot of people couldn't afford it. This is this is land speculation. It's just there's no other way to phrase it, um, and unless you approach it that way, it's going to kind of keep coming up, and you're going to keep putting your council and your citizens in some pretty difficult positions. And and I don't like to get yelled at either. They, you know, it's kind of nice when somebody calls up and says, "Hey, by the way, I got your letter. Um, let's talk about it." Versus, "Oh my God, you you guys are taking away my home." Um. Yeah, I think um, the quality of the residential neighborhoods is the key for the town being involved and make sure that the community, you know, is respectful to that. But I agree in that there's a lot of effort put in by the city. I'm not sure other than that what they get out of it. And I know there's a lot of missteps, um, no regulations or how to enforce it was set up before actually doing the programs. And so I think that would be the only issue that probably should be addressed first. You know, I've gotten into the, our process quite a bit. I would just echo what Jay said that your council, um, how did our council basically evaluated it by who was in the room every night, and it lasted for 
eight months. So every, you know, it was really by the end of the by the end when they finally passed the regulations, there was ten property managers that showed up to every meeting. Um, and again, our locals have jobs and three jobs. That, you know, they could show up to one or two meetings, and they can voice their opinion about, hey, this is really starting to impact me. But by the end of a long drawn out process, so my I guess this is more of a lesson learned or whatever it would be. Again, I would agree with Jay that you know really putting a lot of emphasis on committee recommendations, planning commission, um, and having that, and making sure that the council buys into giving this committee or planning commission a lot of uh, latitude on the recommendation is important because it, it ultimately allows the public process to play out um, through that. And then when it does get to the, to the council, it's been well vetted, uh, and it, then you don't have to redo everything that the community did for six months, which is what we did. Which is, I, I always say that I lost my hair on other things, but this turned me gray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, did a, we did a task force, a public task force, and it was we tried to get people from both sides. Um, it was very contentious. Uh, we had some neighbors that had been fighting with a vacation rental for you know, probably years. They're very frustrated. I think they, they get sensitized to it. So it got to a point where anything that happened to the vacation rental, they were up in arms. You know, it's kind of like a, drip, a, a dripping faucet. It really isn't that loud. But in the middle of the night, if you started listening to it, you know, it just rings in your head. So <laughs> anything the neighbor would do, they would, they would get uh, upset about. We had those people on, as well as vacation rental uh, owners. And um, they spent a lot of time working on it. They looked at a lot of different communities like this. Um, we reached out to CAST, and that was a, the Colorado Association has ski towns has a report on um, vacation rentals that was very helpful, and then um, then we had the we had charrettes and public meetings of the task force. Then it went to the planning commission, and then there were hearings before the uh, town board and the board of county commissioners for a lot of input. Um, we did recognize, though, this is an, on the other side. This is an important part of our product uh, inventory as a as a destination community. And this is something a lot of people do want to stay in, and we, we're not opposed to them because it is something people are looking at. And one of the things that we like to have is a broad spectrum from you know cheap one-bedroom cabins that people can stay in in campgrounds to multi-million dollar homes that people can rent for you know ten thousand dollars a week, depending on what they want. So as part of our inventory, we want to offer the demand is there. We want to do that for our guests and make sure it's it's there but balance that with the needs of the full-time residents. So it's, it's not all bad, I agree with you, it's not all bad, it is an inventory. And a lot of uh, travelers are looking for that these days. They don't want to stay in a, in a hotel. And in some ways, if you've got a big family, it's actually more affordable than getting six hotel rooms uh, to actually buy a house with a kitchen to be able to eat there. It's an affordable way and a good way to go on vacation. So we want to support those people and want them in our community as well. Just as a follow-up to that then, as you went through the adoption process, what were the particular fears? Were there, were there community fears that were being, being expressed, concerns about uh, what this was going to do either to individual livelihoods or to the community as a whole? What were you hearing from people? Whoever wants to jump in. Well, we heard on both sides. One is there, there would be no place to live, there would all be rentals, everyone would be forced out. There would be no workers in town, all the rest would have to shut down because nobody could work there because there wasn't any place to live. Um, there are other folks that said, well, I'm going to have to sell my house and it's been our family for generations. If I can't rent it, we can't afford it. So it'll go downhill and it'll turn into, we'll just abandon it and we'll be full of mice and the town. Will, both sides of it basically was, if you do this, um, the town will go to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Well, it didn't. You know, it was, it was, but there were, there were a, lot of, a lot of fears out there. One thing that did happen that was kind of interesting is that some new businesses popped up. I think we have two new property management businesses um, that are actually doing really well. And the properties that they manage are some of the ones that, we, that are really managed well. If The ones we had the most problem with was were the houses where the owner lived in Omaha or somewhere. Right. They'd rent it out. Um, They'd say the key was underneath the rock, or a neighbor would just hand it to them. Or, um, it was no property management. No property management. They didn't look at it. Uh, they weren't available on the weekends if something went wrong. They came out and looked at it maybe once a year. And with the professional property management, 
that's really cleaned it up, um, and it's created some jobs. Ours is um, probably the loss of the housing was a fear, and um, just having, um, I guess, people coming and going a lot in the residential neighborhoods, and the neighbors weren't you know, really liking that too much. What about fears of, of the regulation? Are there concerns about if council adopted this ordinance, what would happen? Um, we didn't hear too much about that. Yeah, I agree. It was going to be either. I mean, whatever side you were fighting against was was the hell in the handbasket. Um, the one thing that surprised me the most is that the management companies came on first. Um, they actually wanted to be part of the solution, probably because they could get, you know, if they were... If we have one guy in town that's got a, um, a management company, and he was... He can be one of the, the most difficult people to deal with, um, but he's a great guy, and he was the first one on board to come in and say, you know, this is the way you do it. And what it allowed us to do is see how and, and hear from the experience of somebody that has actually managed property and done this before. Um, it's kind of like the guy who goes in and says, what I really want to do out of college is own a restaurant. And he's never even gone out to dinner. I mean, <laughs> you know, it really helps to have people that know the business on, on hand. I wasn't involved in the initial process, so I'm not sure what the largest concerns were, but I think it's probably the same as all the other communities. I know this is fresh for you, so. Oh, um, I mean, I agree with Frank. It was, it was both sides of the equation. Um, the real estate community came out in our, you know, saying that this was going to kill the, kill the town, they would never sell another house. Um, you know, the, the locals were, you know, they had pictures of trash cans that got torn apart by bears and people parking on flower their flower beds. I mean, so it was it was a, it was very much um, both sides. But I think the one thing that is unique about Crested Butte is that if you do live, especially if you live within the one square mile of our town, everybody has um, the same values. And so at the end of the day, I think that was probably the most important thing was that there was, there was a set of community values where we value having locals in our community. Um, and when we were able to really circle back to that, um, we were able to get the property managers. The real estate community still hates it. Um, but we were able to at least get the property managers and the, some of, the, some of the, the locals. And then I think the realization that this has had impacts on affordable or workforce housing um, has led to putting the tax that initiative forward for it. So um, I think it was, it, again, is mixed completely emotionally. Um, to, <laughs> I've heard all the arguments that you said. <laughs> so. Has your tax passed? Or is it uh, this is no, November. And that's a 5% use tax? Yep. Okay. <coughs> okay, so that's kind of the fears and concerns going in. Um, some of you with track records. What, what have the results been so far? What, you've heard from property owners, you've heard from property managers, you've heard from, from, from realtors. Um, what, have, what have the results been? And anything in particular unexpected, unexpected consequences uh, that you found along the way? Jay, we'll start with you. Me? Um, I think the biggest thing to think of is that and I, I've got the quote wrong, but it's that 99.9% .9 versus the tenth of a percent. You spend a lot of time on that very small portion, um, and the others just kind of go along. It's they're really, you know, it's it's really easy to do. Um, I think something that the way I've changed the way I'm looking at it is there's a lot of things that a homeowner or a long-term renter will do at the property that short-term will not. Um, a long-term renter will not park on the flowers. They won't block the neighbor's driveway. The, you know things like that. The short-term will, and so that's it's it's the stupid little things that make the difference. Um, it's like everything. Um, it's just these small little problems that you think you know you think you've got it under, and then you've got five people calling about it. Um, the parties and things like that. I think that we thought those, and, and the neighbors did too, they thought it would be bigger. 
We, again, out of our 25 or 29 different units that we've got, we've got um, two that are a real problem. Um, we have two, um, two, one is one of the problems and one is another one, that they ended up separating up the, the, the uh, property so that they turned it into a triplex versus a single family home when you think about what they did. Um, this is different than like the condo hotel where you could do a lock off unit. Um, this is actually three kitchens, everything. Um, when we did, when we did these inspections for the first round, we actually charged 300 bucks a year. Um, we charge 120 for a business license, but for a short term rental, we charge $300. Um, and if we have to go back out and reinspect it because their their smoke detector didn't work or something, that's another that we'll charge them seventy five for the second return. Um, there's a lot of training that goes involved in having somebody be able to walk into somebody's house. There's liability insurance. There's all sorts of things that you don't think about because nobody. I mean, I have to pay the the, the insurance bills, so I see it. Nobody, the people that are walking into the house don't. Um, I, uh, I really think the, something that I didn't think would happen and has happened a lot more is the same house will be short term at one point of the year, long term at another point, and owner use at another point. Um, and obviously they can't get the short term as much in the summer, so they do a longer midterm, three month, whatever it is. Um, they dump down to short term real quick. Um, it's just there. It 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 keeps changing. Just when you think you realize what the face looks like, it changes. But I don't think I don't think we had the problems that I that we thought we would, or that the citizens thought we would. I think in my time we've only had like one complaint, but we do uh, require that the license be visible in a window of the rental and so the neighbors will call that contact person on there the local contact has to be on that license and so they will call and usually it's just resolved if it's parking issue whatever so we don't hear a lot of complaints we do have one problem that you might think about Minturn was the very first town to do bear proof trash cans because we have um, generations of bears that know where the good pizza boxes are um, and our trash pickup day is Wednesday that means that we I mean that the, the, the resident manager the, uh, the, the local manager is, is a real big benefit with that one because they'll pull the trash out and put it back um, whether and, and we'll actually you know we'll cite people for keeping their trash can out on the side of the street for the week I did it the trash can. We had a big storm in January and got trash service suspended for a couple of weeks. And I spent <coughs> nights till three in the morning moving trash can trash cans in front of plows for our public works department. And I can tell you because I know the map so well, they were all short term rentals. I put their trash cans out and I left them out there. And the problem was that normally our public works department just trashes their can with the plow, but they were full. Um, and so when they started hitting trash cans, they put trash everywhere on the streets. And so we actually had to go and physically move them. And standing out in front of a plow with two feet of snow on the ground and moving short-term rental trash cans, <laughs> I can tell you from experience, it's not fun. Really spend a, <laughs> spend the night. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there were, there were two things that surprised me. One was, and I really liked some of the communities that have done the no transferring, was uh, we weren't expecting the speculation of people who want to get in under the cap, get their license, just in case they might want to later on make it a vacation home. Um, I think if you get rid of the train, or, to, or the realtors are saying it makes it more marketable because you can sell it as a house right. or a vacation home, um, that, that we weren't expecting. The other one, and we had to cut some people some slack, was the inaccuracy of the assessor's records. Um, There's some of that where people were saying the hallway was a bedroom. There are other ones where somebody bought the house you know, 40 years ago, it was four bedrooms, there were four legal bedrooms, the assessor never caught up, caught up with it. And they were surprised when they said, well, what do you mean I don't have four legal bedrooms? Mm -hmm. Now, some of that goes back on them, 
because all these years they weren't really willing to go down to the county and say, hey, tax me more, I have four bedrooms, not three. Uh, so I do put some of that responsibility back on them. But some of the assessor's records were pretty inaccurate, and we've spent a lot of time through the inspections going back and forth right. and trying to, uh, we call it reconcile, we're doing this rec reconciliation between what they say they have, what they legally have, and what they actually have. So it's not all people stressing bedrooms that aren't bedrooms. Some of it is they had no clue that the assessor didn't recognize them as having the number of bedrooms they had. But interestingly, it's always the the, the conservative side. They, I thought we had four bedrooms oh, in yeah. the assessor role, but we've only been paying for two. I mean, you know. Yeah, I've never heard of anybody going Yeah, nobody bedrooms. ever came <laughs> back and said, you know, we had eight bedrooms a while ago, but now we've only got four. <laughs> I do think it's an issue, and it was mentioned briefly, but uh, that I would love to see CML and CCI and CAS go after is this issue of taxation. Right. Um, it is, I think it is patently unfair that these things that are clearly businesses, particularly with, with Gallagher, are ta taxed at the residential rate when the hotel across the street is taxed at 29% of the assessed value. Right. Uh, and we just dropped from 796 to 72. Exactly. Um, I think that is totally unfair, and I think um, at some point we need to get the legislature to address that. And if you're going to run a business, and a vacation rental is a business, mm -hmm. you should be taxed like a business and paying property taxes like a business. And that's going to take some effort by all these different entities to get that to happen. And on the business side of things, or the use, um, I think that was one of, the, one of the forefront issues, especially because of what we require for, we have what's called resident affordable are occupied affordable housing requirements, and it's basically a fee. And if you're building a house, it's a very, I mean, it's still a big ch a check that you cut. It's in the, somewhere between ten and $25,000 that goes into an affordable housing fund. Um, but compared that to someone that actually does a business, they actually have to build an affordable housing with that. And so, you know, just the, when you start talking about playing fields and building codes, being in the IRC or the IBC, and, and then operating as a transient mutual is clearly an IBC building code issue is not fair. Uh, it's not fair to any any hotel that established. Um, there's reasons our hotels are small is because they don't want to have to build three or four affordable housing units. And so that playing field in the business, and I echo what you've said, the Gallagher Amendment really taxes businesses a whole heck of a lot more than someone who's clearly doing that. And we ran through one of our first ideas for trying to generate funds was trying to go after commercial assessments and directing property tax um, to affordable housing. And we got the same response from the assessor and from the state that these, you know, just the state statutes don't permit you to do it. Okay. So share with us, if you will, kind of lessons learned. Now that you've been through this, uh, like I say, uh, Michael, in your, your case, you haven't adopted yet, but but what have you learned along the way that you would share with any jurisdiction that's considering going there with either fees and licensing or, or some kind of restrictions and regulations? What are the kind of the big picture, um, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? I can be quick. Sure. Um, one is that this issue is going to affect both ends of the spectrum. It's going to affect your workers, your local workers that work in restaurants, and it's going to affect your million dollar investor in a house and it's going to be a, a real interesting experience putting those two people in the same room um, so hold up hold on tight there's no clear regulation i think you can hear that everybody has a different way of approaching this it's going to be unique to whatever you guys decide um, and then the last thing i would tell you is that make sure you put your staff in a good position once you pass the regulation and have strong enforcement we have a suspension of a license we have fines, um, but without a without good enforcement, then you're just putting your staff out there to basically um, try to enforce something that's not really enforceable. I'd say do it yesterday. Um, this is a, this is here to stay. It's a change in the travel market. The demand is there. Uh, we didn't even touch on the Airbnb issue and how that affects communities as well. Not renting single rooms. Um, so I, I think there's a change in the in the market, and it's here to stay. And communities ought to be addressing it now, than waiting until it's uh, out of control and you can't do anything about it. 
And we send out notifications to the neighbors. Um, we were doing it twice, um, once notifying them that they were going to be doing it and then um, approving it. And I think we learned that we don't need to do it the second time around because it's kind of a big process to do that mailing. And that our parking regs need to be more specific in the ordinance and spell it out more what, how many are allowed and what, what it is. Number of cars per residence. Mm -hmm. Um, I was actually on the town council in Silverthorne when we did one of the factory stores and they wanted a, a variance on their size of parking space and I came back and said you guys realize most people are coming up in trucks and suburbans not Volkswagens um, I think that's kind of key is that the parking if they say they've got four spots I want to be able to use four spots um, and that includes just after the snowstorm that we had last week I mean you know um, I think that I agree that this is you need a place it's here to stay you do need to have teeth in it um, in a small town people are notorious for getting upset at staff and going to council um, if the council can turn back and say you know this is the law we passed they're just enforcing what we passed if you don't like the law we'll look at it again well they never want to go to that level so it's good to start with with you, and you don't need the teeth, but it's nice to know they're there. Um, I also think, and again, I told you that I don't have any large hotels or anything, condo hotels or anything. I grew up in hotels. I, this is something that is so easy to do, just to make a, a million bucks kind of thing. Um, and it, it's, got a, it's got a big backlash against some of your established motels. And, and they put a lot of money and a lot of respect into into the the community, hoping to be able to to bank on that. And this is kind of a slap in the face to them. And I've seen certain hotels. I've got a brother that owns a hotel right now, and he said there's a lot of backlash on it. In fact, it's in Durango. Um, there's a lot of backlash that the hotels and the places that had to put up this vast amount of money and taxes and, and payments, now anybody can do it. And it's eating away at their bed base. So they are seeing more occupancy in the hotels. Mm -hmm. Any final comments on that? Brody, do we have Scott's number? Nice, interesting segue. Thanks for mentioning Durango. We'll get uh, Scott Shine, who's their planning director online, ask him to kind of briefly uh, run through these uh, questions and paint the picture for, for you for Durango. Hi Scott, it's Randy in Frisco. How are you today? I'm doing well, Randy. How are things going? Doing well. We've got a room full of uh, people that have just been talking about short-term rentals and we're glad you could join us to uh, join the conversation. Yeah, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm um, excited to talk to you guys. Great. Okay. I'm, I'm still waiting for my lunch to show up. Is that on its way? or? <laughs> We'll get it there yet, in about six hours. All right. Time for dinner. Good. Scott, if you would, um, kind of start by painting the picture in Durango. What led Durango to, to consider adopting regulations and limitations on, on short-term rentals? What were the issues, the problems, the nuisances, et cetera? Yeah. Um, I guess it's, it's first important to know that Durango had been um, regulating what we call vacation homes um, since 1989 when we adopted our most recent past zoning code. We had a, a classification for vacation homes, but it was, you know, a lot of times overlooked, and as you all know, it wasn't um, as popular as an option until the, the launch of Airbnb and VRBO, and then it really took off um, mid-2000s. Um, and then 2010 or so um, sort of went off exponentially. So we had them on our radar. We, we do have a strong tourist economy, um, but we generally feel like we want to avoid becoming um, 
a, a sort of a resort town or um, a town that is strictly um, catering to, to tourism. We want to have a year-round economy. We have the college here, um, and we want to have some a, a community that's more robust than just a, a single economic driver. So um, as vacation rentals got more popular, uh, we started to get some complaints about their impacts on the neighborhood, um, primarily noise, um, garbage, numbers of vehicles, um, and so we realized it was becoming more of a, a prominent issue. And again, when we sort of step back and look at the bigger picture vision of who we want to be as a community and um, some of the things we're facing, we thought that trying to get ahead of vacation rentals and take a, what is really a, a tightly regulated and, and a conservative approach, conservative in the sense of how many are allowed, um, we thought that would be the way to protect our interests uh, that we were trying trying to accomplish. So um, we felt like it could further um, exacerbate high housing prices by, you know, allowing speculation and then short-term rental and and taking some of those units um, out of the the housing stock for long-term residents. And so. Um, we, we, like I said, tried to get ahead of it and take a pretty tight approach. We also had a very active um, neighborhood group that had experienced some issues with um, unregulated vacation rentals and were very vocal and, and engaged in the public process um, to, to limit how many were allowed in our residential neighborhood. Great. Okay, thank you, Scott. Would you... Take just a, a few minutes and describe for us then the, the Durango approach. What what is your uh, the the gist of your ordinance and and what are your regulations? Mm -hmm. So, they, in addition to requiring uh, business licenses and remitting lodgers tax, um, the sort of the three key components of our vacational program um, are that they're only allowed in limited zone districts, so they're not allowed in all locations in the city. Um, in the areas where they are allowed, um, we have a cap on the overall number of vacation rental permits that we're allowed to issue. Um, and that was decided on um, through the public process, and the number that was used was 3% of the overall parcels in a given neighborhood. That was the number um, that, that established the cap. So we, have, we limited where they're located. We put a cap on the areas where they are located. And then we have separation requirements. We didn't want um, short-term rentals to be cl clustered in a specific area um, and overwhelm that, that block or that part of a neighborhood uh, by converting them all into short-term rentals. So we use a... Um, initially, we had a 500-foot radius um, buffer where once a permit was issued, another one could not be issued within 500 feet. That went down to 300 feet, and then our most recent iteration is per block face or street segment, so one per block on either side of the street is allowed under the standard permitting process. There is a provision to allow a second one, but that takes additional review in a, in a public hearing. Um, to allow a second one on the block. So um, there's a lot more details there I could get into, but, but I guess I'd summarize it by say limiting where they're allowed, not in all of our residential neighborhoods, um, capping when they are allowed in a residential neighborhood, establishing a cap, and then requiring buffering or separation between permitted units. And have you reached that limit? Are there neighborhoods where yes. there's no more allowed? Yes, in the two neighborhoods, um, two residential neighborhoods where vacation rentals are allowed, we have reached the cap. And what happens then? Um, we have established a waiting list, and that was really fun because we didn't get that set up before. So we had a lottery um, with the initial wait list to establish the order of the wait list. Uh, we joked about getting the, the sort of rolling ball and, and getting dressed up and picking out the numbers from the lottery. 
uh, to establish that. It wasn't quite that elaborate, but um, we have a wait list that was established um, for both neighborhoods. And now if somebody comes in and they're in one of those neighborhoods, um, they just get added to the bottom of the wait list. Okay. Well, Durango's been at this for some time, and so you probably have a pretty good sense of what the, I call it the costs and the benefits of limiting STRs might be. What, how would you describe those? Yeah. Um, yeah, when I saw that question, we didn't really run any sort of real uh, formal or, or analytic on the cost benefits, but some of those things I referred to earlier about our community goals, um, the desires for our community to remain a year-round economy and um, to preserve the, the high quality of life in our established neighborhoods, not let that deteriorate or that sense of community or connection with neighbors deteriorate. So that's sort of the overarching things. Um, we just did an update to council last week or two weeks ago, and we're actually proposing to remove them from some additional zones, some of the, some of the mixed-use zones in Durango take vacation rentals out as an option. And, and what we said there is, you know, a lot of communities in, in, are in a place where they don't really, they aren't concerned about how many there are. They just want to have them permitted and make sure they're paying their lodger's tax and, and have it be a level playing field. Um, for us, what, what we said and reiterated with council is that we're taking a little bit um, longer view. And even though we could, if we opened up the door and you know, allowed a lot more of these, we could theoretically get some more lodger tax and in a time when we're sort of projecting flat sales tax revenues for the next next year, um, that might be an attractive option. But our, our council has said no, that the impacts and the, um, the negative outcomes of opening up the door to get more lodger tax are not worth um, sort of the uh, the, the long-term ramifications. So um, those are some of the cost benefits that we talked about. I think generally everybody understands, even the, the real estate community and people who want to uh, pursue short-term rentals, they understand when we explain those, those goals of the program to preserve housing for residents, to you know preserve the neighborhood context. They get that when we communicate that message. So is this still part of the community conversation at council meetings or as you go out in the, in the community at the neighborhood meetings and such? Are you still hearing from, from residents about impacts or, or effects on their livelihood, uh, real estate, the community, the property managers? Um, they say it's been in effect for some years now, but what, what's the community conversation like at this point? Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing is we've had relatively few issues with permitted vacation rentals, so we feel like if they're uh, sort of together enough and legit enough to go through a permitting process and meet all those requirements, they generally run a good operation. So noise, trash, those sort of things for permitted units hasn't been a big issue, so that's a good, good win. Um, the, the main community conversation right now is around enforcement and tracking um, non-permitted activity. So we've really tried to focus our efforts there. And um, I'm sure you may have talked about this. The companies that offer monitoring services, there's a company called Host Compliance that Durango has a contract with. Um, and they provide us monthly reports. And we use that information to um, issue letters and, and initiate enforcement actions um, when we need to. So that's been the focus. It's just, okay, we've got this great program in place. Now how do we really make sure it's being effective and, and enforce it? Uh, it's interesting because we have a council member who's a realtor who's also actively involved in vacational management. And he sort of passed some things on about, well, when it really discourages second home buyers from coming into the city because of these standards, and a lot of them are driven out to the county or up to our ski resort, which is about 20 or 30 minutes outside of town, 
and we're kind of saying, all right, that, that's kind of what we <laughs> what we wanted to do. Um, but some people in the community obviously see that as a as a downside, but um, we see it as sort of um, accomplishing some of those goals. Uh, we obviously have to balance that. We don't want to just you know totally kill or, or eliminate a growing real estate economy, but we feel like. Um, discouraging speculation, discouraging part-time residents in our situation um, is, is a good outcome in, in large terms. Okay. You mentioned briefly that uh, the current discussion is about maybe um, limiting them in some places even further, but what, what other kind of results have you seen or um, lessons have you learned that, that you would share for other communities that are considering adopting some limitations or regulations? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been overall well received from the residents. We, you know, people, it's been a part of the, you know, local news and, and public meetings, um, and so it's on people's minds, and so they, um, the real estate community understands what's going on. I think that's really the main thing is even if they don't know specifics, they know that it's not just a wide open door. They should call us. Um, and at least inquire about where it's an option or not an option. Um, so I think that's been really helpful that it's just on people's minds. Um, yeah, and some of the things I shared earlier I think relate to that. And, you know, so there's a big housing movement right now and looking at ways to uh, increase affordable and attainable housing. And so this has come up as sort of a, a, an arrow in the quiver of um, keeping housing prices manageable. Uh, so yeah, overall I think it has good support. Obviously some people get frustrated when we tell them they can't. Um, but like I said, usually that's on the front end now before someone buys a property or, or does something, they're usually checking with us and they don't get and caught in a situation where, where it's sort of unexpected. Okay, great Scott. There's a lot more we can ask you and I think we've got a, um, a room full of participants here who probably have uh, questions that, that uh, you can address as well. So let's throw it open to, uh, to questions from people who've been patiently listening. So it's your show now. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Um, I actually have three questions, sorry. Um, so I, I'm assuming that timeshares or condos that frequently end up short-term rented for a week or so are not included in definition of the short-term rental, so not cash, so there's some other animal. Could you hear that, Scott? One question. Um, well, hold on, yep. take a more time. Okay. So, timeshares and uh, kind of hotels, kind of hotels less than a week at a time, are they included in your regulations? We consider them the same as an accommodation. Uh -huh. They have to be in the accommodation zoning and they're allowed. How about an indirect, Scott? No, um, a timeshare is a different category. Um, and there's only a few in town, but those, uh, yeah, are treated, they're in commercial zones, so they're treated a little bit differently. Okay. Um, we see a lot of um, a short-term rental of just a bedroom, not the full unit. And I know you might, you might have started to go there, but if I just rent short-term my basement unit, bedroom down there, is that included in your cap? Yeah, yes. any short-term rental. Anything, anything less than 30 days is short-term rental. Even if I live there as well. Right. Yeah. Cars, uh, they're prohibited. Short-term okay. short rentals, you cannot have an owner occupy at the same time. Uh -huh. It has to be, the owner can't live there. So rentals, right now they're prohibited. So that's the classic Airbnb kind of model where you're renting out of a right. exactly. Prohibited at NSS Park. You need the rest of you prohibit those? We don't enforce it very well. It's something we need to look at as the next one we look at. Um, I'm not sure how much of a problem it is because there are out there, but right now that's prohibited. Okay. So how about in Durango, general, Scott? Well, yeah, in general, they count towards the caps. If Ours out. don't. We don't count. Yeah. Don't yeah, in Durango, we treat them the same as a whole house rental, but we have um, heard a lot from the community that they'd like to see that sort of differentiated, and so we've uh, started crafting how we call vacation rentals. We just refer to them as vacation rentals now, and they're all lumped into a category. We started crafting a section of our code 
to address short-term room rentals with some other um, qualifying conditions like the owner has to be present um, and some other things. So we're exploring that um, as an option. We don't feel like short-term room rentals have quite the same impact as a whole house um, sort of absentee owner model. And so we're willing to look at that um, as a different category. Less restrictive. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the last part of that is, um, you know, we're concerned that the short-term rentals do um, have a significantly larger um, job generation in terms of creating jobs um, than long-term rental or other residential uses. Um, was the impact um, on sort of not only the loss of housing that might be available for people to rent by employees, but also the fact that these short-term rentals create the demand for more workforce housing. Was that considered as part of any of your conversations about this? I know for the, our, ta for our town, um, again, getting into our actual fees of when you do construction, the biggest issue that you have is normally these houses are already there and constructed, the unit, mm -hmm. and so a change of use we base all, all, all of our nexus studies are based off of the square footage calculation. Um, and so again, I think the response to that has been to put forward the tax measure. We didn't hear about the housing issue, but we did hear from the, from the owners that this is, this is an economy that's out there. And by limiting it then, you limit the jobs. Yeah. Um, because they do have cleaning people and people go in and work on the houses and and that is a segment that they said you need to take into consideration. We didn't talk about the housing for those workers, but they did bring up that if you limit it, you also then limit the job opportunities for those ones. Actually, for us, it was just the owner saying that they could make money off of it. There was no consideration of any superfluous jobs coming due or anything like that. It was just, it was just what could what could the, the, the benefit be from that particular unit? Scott, impact on jobs in Durango? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting point, not really something that we've talked about a whole lot. We have a big hospitality industry already, so I think, I don't know how much it would create new jobs versus just sort of add some opportunities. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting point to consider, I guess. Next question. Yes. Um, I have a question specifically for a couple of the municipalities up there. Um, my first one is for you, Jay. How did you make assessments based on looking at the RPO listings and providing tax assessments to the people? I believe what you're asking is how did I know that they owed money? Well, how did you calculate your assessment by just looking at their VRBO page? Um, what I would do is if I would see the VRBO and then I would say, I would see that they had their earliest recommendation was a year ago. So then when I would contact them and they'd say, well, we haven't had anybody stay there, I'd say, well, I've actually seen five different or ten different recommendations on it, um, and I need to see your books. And if they really fight about it, then you can actually call the state, and the state will go right after them um, because they're doing our collection for us. So. I mean, the idea was not to get into a dogfight. It was to, one, get them in compliance, and two, collect what we could. We actually assume 100% booking unless they can provide, provide it otherwise. So the ones we've caught, we've actually said, you know, you have 30 days to show us your books, or we're going to assume that you are booking at the rate that you have advertised full year round. Hmm. Okay. Experience in SS Park with that? Um, no, it really wasn't much of an issue. Georgetown, Salina? We didn't try and go backwards on anything. Right. How about in Durango, Scott? Did you hear that question? A little bit about um, collecting tax, past taxes. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't tried to go back. If we find something that's unpermitted, we just um, issue a cease and desist letter. <coughs> Next question? Yes. Just a, um, a question for Michael. You represent the town of Crystal, right? <coughs> Correct. 
So what are the, I'm, I'm curious as to Mount Crest of view, what are the regulations there? Have short-term rentals just scurried there? What's been the net impact on, say, the county? Um, that's a good question. So Mount was interesting, there's a really interesting dynamic between the mountain and the town. But actually, the mountain for, for almost forever has really been the bed base. So that's where the high-rise, um, the short-term rental accommodations have been done. And when we actually looked um, at a county-wide tax on uh, short-term rentals, they would have produced a whole heck of a lot more. They have close to 1,100 units that are short-term. A lot of that's condo hotels or whatever. Um, and so they're, and again, I think their full-time population is 120 folks compared to 1,500. So they, um, they're not so into, I mean, again, their economy was for the last 30 or 40 years has been based on that model. Um, so they're, they're not really into the, again, they, where, where, where all the other municipalities have fallen is they've gone into getting, we all <coughs> have a contract for a compliance software company. And again, I think the other municipalities, the county, um, the town, uh, even so the city of Gunnison, their main focus is on bringing people into sales tax uh, compliance. You experienced with that in Durango, Scott? Sorry, I missed the question. The question is, um, by, by limiting the number of, of short-term units in Durango, have you seen some shifting to nearby areas, perhaps um, outside of the, the city into the county? Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, purgatory is 30 minutes away, and, and there's a lot of condos, a lot of short-term rentals up there, and, and we sort of feel like that's a good spot for them and appropriate. And, and then the county has just recently started to um, inventory and see what, what's going on in the county, but there's, there's a lot more out in the county than in the city. So yeah, and that's anecdotally what we hear from real estate agents and, and others is that they get pushed outside the city. So we've definitely seen that. Okay. Yes. I'm curious, in light of all these comments, we're talking about you have Just to summarize that question, it's, it's advice for those of us who may be considering collaborating on this. What, how do we do that well in, a, in an environment where we've got uh, county and a number of municipalities um, here that need to work together? Lessons learned on that? Well, we don't have an issue because we have already collaborated formally. We have a single planning unit for the county and the city, which actually makes it so much simpler for a lot of things. Also makes things so much more difficult for a lot of things as well. <laughs> Um, and I've been on both sides. I was the county manager for 18 years before I did this, so I've sat on both sides of that. But overall, it's, it's a great model. You know, I think if you could collaborate and come up with a model ordinance that the county would adopt as well as the, the municipalities, so you don't have this squeeze the balloon and pushes it out somewhere else because a lot of your community is so close, would be a real advantage. Keep in mind that the county does have some different limitations that you may have as even a statutory town or, or a home rule town. And so you have to be a little flexible to, to adopt to those abilities that the county has to do. But I think the more uniformity you get, the better the system would be across the whole of all Summit County. Mm -hmm. Did you have that issue in Durango, Scott? I think um, the, the dialogue sort of started in the city and in the more dense residential neighborhoods. And then it became a bigger community issue, and the county realized, um, particularly, that they're missing out on potential revenue. So they pursued um, a contract with a company to, to go out and do some monitoring and identification of, of units that were being short-term rented. So, um, and we've helped a lot. We've provided information to the assessor's office about that. They've indicated they were going to start. Um, taxing them differently and taxing them for commercial property. Um, I don't know if that has fully happened yet, but we've definitely collaborated back and forth um, with both the assessor and the county planning office. We also, I, I, I realize we take a pretty tight 
approach to it. Um, but up front, we did have a we we reached out. We had a roundtable with property managers, with hotel operators, uh, with real estate agents, and we really tried to talk through the issue with that community. It's not just a um, sort of one-sided thing that we're pushing on everyone, but we talked to them about the larger community goals and and um, got to a place where they were at least comfortable with how we were regulating them. So. There's collaboration among city and county, and then I'd also say, you know, trying to reach out, understand property manager and the real estate community's concerns. So we've been been doing that throughout the process. We were actually told by our county assessor that you could not tax one of these commercially. Um, you know, the it's a residence is a residence is a residence, um, and as far as the collaboration goes, we did an awful lot. I found out that when uh, Vail was one of them, they actually put a moratorium in and banned it for, and I think it still is, but I'm not positive. Um, and that caused, I mean, it's kind of like you ask a question one place and all of a sudden it's answered somewhere else. So it did cause people to come over to us more. Um, and kind of the idea was there, let's go ahead and expand on it for the other the other municipalities. But I think this is also a real good one is to, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of people that have already done it. Um, you know, when we did our lodging tax, I was on, constantly on the phone with Carrie and Dylan going, hey, do you have this letter? <laughs> and it's really easy to get some of that stuff. Um, but you start, you don't realize what you didn't ask. Who was it said you don't know what you don't know until you don't know? <laughs> what bites you? Other questions? Yeah, right. I'm just curious um, how how your councils answered the question that I could see coming up, where maybe I live next door to a VRBO and we've got new regulations in place, but they happen to be the one on my block. And so, what's the answer to that's great that you know we're, we're protecting the character of the overall neighborhood or community, but I'm still next to a VRBO, so I'm sort of next to different zoning in my mind. What's what's the equity? I think if I could jump in on that, the um, we notice, we post and notice uh, the property when we get an application for a vacation rental. And so a lot of times we'll get calls like that, you know, like, oh, you know, I thought these were prohibited. Why are you letting it next door? I don't like vacation rentals. Um, but we have a really sort of comprehensive set of standards related to parking, related to posting information about garbage and quiet hours and nuisances and things. And so we sort of, I think with that program in place, we're able to respond to that and say, yes, it will be a short-term rental, but it will be, you know, permitted. It has to abide by these strict set of, of conditions. If you observe things that are happening that are impacting you, um, you can call us and we have, you know, that, that property on file, we can look at the conditions placed on the permit, see if they're violating any of those, and and pursue enforcement if, if necessary. So by having the program and having the tighter standards, I think we're able to address some of those concerns and say we're trying to get it to fit in better with the residential character instead of it just being sort of a standalone commercial type of use. We're trying to get it so that it doesn't have those impacts they're concerned about. And I would say that that's, you know, I did a lot of that. And again, a lot of what we tried to address is neighborhood impacts. Um, and so we're going from a place where there was no ramifications to what now there being ramifications, whereas if the marshal's department shows up and issues a citation that goes against the record. And again, if they get, if there's enough complaints or it becomes a, a nuisance in any way, there are, there's again, you have to have teeth in your ordinance that allows you to revoke the license. You know, another option we haven't talked about, but we have some neighborhoods that in the covenants prohibit it as well. And yeah. so, so if there are neighbors, neighborhoods that are concerned about that, um, you, there are usually ways to change your covenants and add it. And certainly if it's non-transferable, I don't think you could take it away from somebody who's doing it, 
but if it's a non-transferable license and you get all the owners to agree to modify the covenants to prohibit short-term rentals, once that one's gone, I think you could probably do it and not have one come back. And to be clear, is it the town enforcing that, or is that? No, no, we don't enforce covenants. I live in a neighborhood that doesn't allow anything less than 60 days. It's up to the association to enforce right. it. Right, right. Okay, next question. Rick. I can't resist. Um, <laughs> so what we have here in town is homeowners associations that can't change their covenants. They want us to make a rule. How do you dealt with that? Obviously, I've seen the result, but what kind of conversations did you guys have? We, I haven't had that with any homeowners associations. You know, if they don't have it in their covenants or they can't change their covenants, that's really up to them. I, I've always said, you know, covenants are a private agreement between the property owners. The town is not getting involved in those no matter what. Right. We stay from that. Now, if you've got them and you want to change them, more power to you, that's up to you. Right. But, they have the tool, but they can't get it to pass. So then, then the ones who want it to change come to town. Yeah, and then we just say, that's sorry. That? Yeah, and then we... we we haven't had that do with it. They can't get their neighbors to agree. That's democracy. It just doesn't. Sorry. We do not enforce covenants. We put we we actually on every land use agreement we do a restricted covenant that comes out of the town, and we could care less what additional restrictions you want to put on. Um, the county actually spends a lot of time reviewing land use covenants for for any kind of, and I can understand a little bit from their perspective because they don't take on what are maintenance of roads and um, the applied subdivisions and such. But from the town's perspective, we already put a restrictive covenant on, on any land use approval you get, and that's that's recorded against your property, and that's what your that's that's the scripture you live off of, from as far as the town's concerned. Right. So did you have that back and forth? It's if, I'm not talking about enforcing their covenants. No, we don't. Like I said, we do not enforce. Do not. Them. But they want the town to make a rule, an ordinance, to essentially make that covenant for them. We won't do it. I mean, if, if it's not in zoning, if, if it's not in this, I mean, the, our restrictive covenants come into the land use approval. So if it was like, for instance, all of our ADU units are restricted. Um, we actually pay two thirds of the tap out of our enterprise fund. We pay 2.1 million. And so we enforce that restrictive covenant and it says it has to be a long-term rental. But that's baked into the land use approval. If say, again, if it's a condominium association and they want to add additional, want to make an HOA doc, and add that on, and they want to restrict that, great. But if they have to go and actually sue the neighbor who's VRBOing after they said no, that's on. That's a civil suit, and we're staying as far out of that as we can. Right, so the other side of that, you, you guys passed your ordinances. Your numbers of folks short-term rental are greater than the number your, your covenant will allow, right? pardon me, your ordinance will allow. How are you then enforcing those posts? Just cease and desist letters? Is that what yeah. Is? I mean, if we catch them, again, the ordinance is such that if, if you get caught, our, it's not even coming out of our department. It's coming directly from the, our town attorney. Um, and again, like we said, the letter is very strongly worded. It's cease and desist. It, if the marshals, every time the marshals show up and they see you renting, it's a thousand dollar fine. For, and every, every, time, every night you rent it is a separate occurrence of a fine. Um, and again, when we do the tax assessment, we go back to the listing. We said this listing was established 2014, so we're going to assume 100 percent occupancy until you show us the books. I just want to follow up. On Who was that? that? Sorry, what community was that? That's Crested Butte. Crested Butte. I just want to follow up. Oh, oh go ahead. Did you have a comment on that, Scott? Sorry, just about the fines. Um, I'd be interested. I'll look for it, but I want to see that language because that's our problem is enforcement and uh, running them through muni court is really ineffective so we've we been looking for ways to beef up our fines so we run it through muni court okay. yeah. Kim. i just wanted to follow up but your caps that that you have in place and limitation those also do apply in neighborhoods where there are covenants homeowner covenants Correct. Yes. But the covenants can override that. Exactly. Yeah. But, but you do still allow, re, um, it will restrict and coveted uh, neighborhoods to have covenants. Yeah, the covenants can't override the, 
the ordinance. Okay. Then the one up follow up question I have is do you also have um, limitations on the number of occupants? I heard one say eight. And do you also um, regulate the use that short term renters are allowed to, to have? Like, can they run a day camp or things like that? No. The number of occupants and the use. The number of occupants is based on the size of the number of bedrooms um, and what, you know, we say not more than three per bedroom, including children. Um, and then that breaks down to the parking. Um, so it's between the occupancy and the bedroom and the parking, they, they're they kind of limited. We do two plus no, we get two and then every bedroom we get two. Um, we cap it at 10 unless you can show us that you, through your land use approval, you were approved for additional bedrooms, and then if you were, you have on-site parking requirements above the two spaces. And so we'll go out and inspect to make sure that the rooms have egress and the additional parking that was required with the land use approval. Scott, are you, are you um, regulating occupancy? Yeah, um, two persons plus two per bedroom. I think I heard that is the same. And then we do not allow another uh, accessory use or anything else, like a home occupancy or, or um, an event or anything else, if they have a vacation rental permit for the property. So it's lodging only. That's yeah. common among all of you. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, Lena. One question about your caps. So do you regulate the number of people that can be in a Kind of both. They they have a license that is annually renewed, um, and they're the first one is on the list as far as you know, we wouldn't take a new one if we were at the cap, unless that one was hanging out there didn't renew. We could pull it because they never renewed it, and then give it to the next the next one in line. So it's not like on January first, let's say your business licenses are due January first, you have a line out the door, and the first one hundred get the licenses, and then the next year you go. To once you're, once you're in, you kind of have a place saving. Is that how everybody does it? Yeah. yeah, we're in the same way. If you had an existing license, you're already in the cap. As long as you pay your fee every year, and again, you have to pay for two years because of the way bookings work. Um, and then we have a waiting list. And so if someone doesn't, if someone doesn't apply by January, um, actually it's 31st because we charge a late fee if they come in after the first book in the 30-day grace period. And then after that, we're... You know, we haven't done this yet, but basically we're going to look at how many licenses we had come in and then how many are freed up um, and we'll issue um, starting at the top of the waiting list the license. Good. Good time for a couple more questions. Yes. We haven't. In fact, some of the discussion, the neighbors didn't want that. It just makes their neighborhood look more commercial. Uh, we do require posting inside each unit, and we require them to notify everyone within 100 yards of the postcard, or um, 100 feet, excuse me, uh, of the po with a postcard that shows who to call, who to notify, and all that, so the neighbors have that information. But I, I think the neighbors actually would push back against that, having commercial signs in a residential neighborhood. We looked at it, and the conversation was no one walks their houses. And so if we have a sign that said vacation <laughs> rental, there was a fear that people would just start walking into the vacation rentals and wasn't taking things. Um, it's, it's, I mean, and then we had a couple of comments. People were like, I lock my house every day. And I was like, I still don't have a key to my house. So it's a new thing. But. <laughs> How was Durango handling that, Scott? Uh, we don't allow exterior signage. And I think there was um, something about listing permit numbers uh, or something. We, we require that the permit numbers be on any advertising for the unit. Uh, so anything online, it needs to have their permit number listed clearly. I don't know if that was the question or not, but. Yes, yes, that helps. 
Yeah, we took that idea from Durango. That was a great idea. It worked really well. If I could follow up on that, I thought I heard earlier, um, I could say that you require that information to be in the window of the property. How does that work in Tree House? We do. It um, seems to work for the neighbors so that they have the contact and it has their license number on there if they were to call us. Like I said, we just had one complaint and they just gave us the license number and we notified the owner. Uh, does it, it also have the um, local on site? It only, has, it only has the local management name and phone number. Phone number. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Is somebody who hasn't asked one? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I have a question and a comment. Um, something that we do in Brackenbridge is we actually require their license posting to be within five feet of the front door. And the reason that we do that is because we've had some emergency calls for somebody who's staying short term, they don't know where they are. Um, right. and so the dispatcher can direct them to, there should be a posting within five feet of your front door that gives the address. We do that. Yeah, we do that. We don't we don't post at the window kind of thing where mm -hmm. an outside source could see it, but yes, inside. Um, and actually, I wrote that down. That's kind of a clever idea to be able to make prank prank phone calls to the manager company. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we just had to say slides. Um, but additionally, I, I was interested in some information about the rest of you, but and your use tax on um, rentals. And then I wanted to know from the whole panel, um, was there a conversation about problems with restricting the owner's property rights? So the use tax, um, the reason we're going with the use tax is that we were able to, through doing a use tax, exclude, um, be very specific on what use is being taxed, right? And, we, and what we didn't want to do is we already have a very high lodging rate, and what we didn't want to do is tax, on top of that, tax the lodging community, and so it was very specific to short-term rentals. So who is the tax upon? It's upon the renter. It's a, it's, it's a basic, the use tax is basically a sales tax. So it's paid at the, at the, at the, at the transaction. What was the second part of your question? The, uh, um, was there a discussion about limiting owner's property rights as part of this capping the number of units you can have? Uh, I mean, that was that was a huge. I mean, on, that was that was my whole side of the argument. And again, I think what's interesting is then you flip that argument on the person and say, well, what about your neighbor who bought their house thinking that they live in a residential zone district, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, I bought a house. I live here with my kids. Is zoned residential. I didn't expect to have a new neighbor every weekend with four cars coming from Denver to, to party and you know not really contribute to the community. Um, and I think that was and again that's what we struggled with um, with creating the ordinance because I think both sides have very good arguments. We heard that too, but I don't think it grows any legs any more than you know my neighbor wants to run a body shop and you know and I want to work on cars in my neighborhood. It's a business. It's, they're trying to run a business in the neighborhood. Zoning has been upheld umpteen times in the courts. It's a zoning restriction. Um, but but you hear, we hear it on any kind of zoning change or any kind of regulation that somebody says it's a restriction on property rights. And, um, those have been pretty well fought out in the courts. Kate, did you have a quick one? Uh, just following up on your credit use tax, does the ballot language specify what that Yes. What is Affordable housing. So and it's, it's basically mitigating the impacts of that. Yeah, and it, well, we have a, an affordable housing fund, and so that the sales tax is collected, or the use tax is collected, and go directly to the affordable housing fund. And then to ratify the election, what the council wants to do is pass an ordinance, basically de delineating how those funds can be used. And we already have a definition in the affordable housing fund of how it can be used, but I think you know, if it passes um, and a lot of new council seated at that point, they're going to want to revisit that and really take a look at it. We've already heard, because um, one of the big things that, one of the hardest things, of, if you guys do affordable housing, you know rental projects are the hardest. That's one of the big things that they want to see the money go towards is creating additional levels. We had one proposal during our process where a group suggested a $2,500 annual fee for each vacation home, mm -hmm. and, that, and that would go directly to affordable housing. Um, and the idea that the and it would be a fee, not a tax. That it's a nexus based on their impact on the community. Um, we didn't do it, but that was an interesting proposal. Okay, I'll ask the panelists to, to hang around just a few more minutes if there are other burning questions. But I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you for all the participants.
great big thank you to our panelists and to Scott. Thank you for joining us by, by phone. I really appreciate you. Thank you.